It is Wednesday, August 17th, 2022, and we're here tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ to study the book of Genesis. So we are jumping back into the book of Genesis tonight. Hope you can join me there, Genesis chapter 14, and we'll be there in just a moment. But we're glad that you have joined us tonight. We're glad that you're here, and we want to invite you to join us in person this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 a.m. for a Bible study and at 10.30 for worship. And if you have any questions about what you see or hear in class tonight, any concerns, or objections or you, there's some question that's raised and you want to know more and uh, if you just want to talk and uh, need the prayers of the church or anything that we can help you with uh, please give us a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com and we would love to hear from you. I just want to say a word of thanks again to all of those who helped with the clothing giveaway this past weekend. It was one week ago tonight that we actually met at the church building, a number of us did. So we watched this class on the projector, so we were there in person for that, and then after class was over, we got together and went downstairs for what we have now uh, lovingly described as cardio night. And so we got all of the clothing downstairs uh, to the upstairs, got that ready to go on Saturday. So thanks to you who joined us in person for that. And then we came to the church building bright and early, 7 o'clock Saturday morning, and uh, 20 or so of our members showed up able to help, and we're thankful for that help. And between 70 and 100 people were helped with free clothing. <clears throat> during the day on Saturday. So a good program, a lot of good was done, some good comments from people in the community, and a lot of lot of work was involved in that. Setting up, taking down, uh, being with people, answering questions, crafts for the children, and just all around a good experience. And I hope that you were able to uh, experience that. And let's be praying for those who were helped that maybe they might uh, uh, be helped spiritually as well. We gave away a number of Bibles and some information about the church and had some good conversations throughout that day. Well, tonight we're back to the book of Genesis. So the book of beginnings written primarily by Moses. We've been looking at a man by the name of Abram for the past several weeks. Abram is chosen by God. He's told to leave his homeland to travel to an unknown land. God would explain it to him along the way, and he obeys. And he makes his way through the land that he's been given. He heads all the way down to Egypt due to a famine. And he is now back in the land of Canaan. So last week we learned that Abram and Lot were getting a little bit too crowded. Their herds did not have enough food, so they had to spread out. And so we learned that Abram, the older uncle, gives Lot, his younger nephew, first choice of the land. And Lot, of course, chooses the well-watered land, the green valley. But of course it is in the direction of Sodom, an exceedingly wicked city. Abram then ends up with land that is much less desirable, but God speaks to him and promises him vast amounts of land and reaffirms the promise that Abram would have many descendants and that the earth would be blessed through them. Well, tonight Abram and Lot are now separated geographically, and we are about to pick up with Genesis chapter 14. So if you could, let's turn together to Genesis chapter 14. If you're joining us online, if you're able to see this on YouTube, we have the text on the screen. I know some of you are just joining us on the phone, so you all only have the audio. But either way, there is a, a real benefit to having the Word of God open in a, on a table in front of us or in our laps or on a device or however you do that. So the first paragraph is Genesis 14, verses 1 through 7. And I suppose before we read this passage, I should probably um, infect your mind with something that I think about every single time I read this chapter. And I almost think of one of the kings mentioned here as King Cheddar. Uh, the big cheese, we might say, uh, so to speak. His name is Cheddar Loamar, the king of Elam. So, Sorry about that. Maybe it's the Wisconsin in me. Maybe it's Culver's. Maybe it was the cheese curds I had on Sunday. I don't know. But I always think of cheese in this passage. So just apologize in advance. There it is. And uh, by the way, we are getting closer to the first reference to curds in the Bible. Not quite yet, but it is definitely coming in Genesis chapter 18. So be prepared for that. Anyway, our first paragraph tonight is Genesis chapter 14. Let's look at verses 1 through 7. Genesis 14, 1 through 7. And it came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, 
Chedor Loamar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Admah, and Shemiber, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, that is, Zoar. All these came as allies to the valley of Sedim, that is, the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Chedor Loamar, but the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Cheddar Loamar and the kings that were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim, and the Zuzim in Ham, and the Imim in Shava Kiriathaim, and the Horites in their Mount Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and conquered all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who lived in Hazazan Tamar. Well, in this first paragraph, we have some warring tribes or kingdoms, and we're not told why they go to war explicitly right here at the beginning, other than a reference to a rebellion down in verse 4. But based on what happened in Genesis 13, I think we may have at least some idea. There's at least some clue that we might have. If you remember in last week's passage, Abram's people and Lot's people were going at it, weren't they, over limited resources, so their flocks and their herds didn't have enough land for food. And their solution, of course, was to separate. And so they left on friendly terms. They were brothers, in a sense. They were family. And so I'm assuming that something similar might be happening on a larger scale, maybe across the entire region. And that is kingdoms are growing and they need more space. They need more resources. They need more food for their flocks and their herds. And of course, this is just speculation on my part, but I do think that it fits in with what we learned in the previous chapters. So that, that seems to be in keeping with the character of the culture at that time. Uh, the population was growing. They were running out of natural resources to uh, care for their families and their flocks. Well, nevertheless, in the kings, uh, the kings in that area, they are uh, around the Dead Sea. And they have served this other coalition of kings for 12 years. And these other kings are from the north and the northeast, basically what we would describe as Iraq and Iran today. So the ancient, even before Babylon was a thing, uh, the kings from up in that direction had come down and had dominated them for a number of years. So they finally had enough. And in the 13th year of this, um, that's it. And so they rebelled. No more. And so I'm guessing they stopped paying taxes. Uh, often a more powerful king would demand some kind of tribute for, um, you know, some kind of tax, we might say. Pay me a certain percentage of your crops, and in exchange, we won't kill you this year. So pay up, that kind of thing. That was common back in those days. Well, after 12 years, uh, the kings around the Dead Sea had had enough, along with some others in that area. And so they just stopped paying, apparently, and um, others had done the same thing. So they take a year to deal with it. But in the 14th year, uh, the king, Cheddar Lormar, um, and the others, they come in and they st uh, start defeating the rebels. So they come in with uh, this overwhelming force, and they make some huge progress. They swoop down from the northeast. They head all the way down the east side of the Jordan River, going beyond the Dead Sea. They go almost all the way to Egypt. And then they turn around, heading back north in order to accomplish their mission. So they are upset. And uh, there is this rebellion that they've squashed, and it's uh, going pretty well for, uh, for them. So let's continue then with Genesis 14, verses 8 through 12. Genesis 14, verses 8 through 12. And the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Admah, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, came out. And they arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Sedim, against Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goam, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sedim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the hill country. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply and departed. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. As the kings from the northeast then are headed back toward home on their way back north, they go to war with the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboim and Bela. That's the area around the pretty much the southern end of the Dead Sea. And the locals lose 
And so they are no match for this overwhelming force coming in from out of town. So some of them flee into the tar pits. Uh, others run for the hills. And in the process, the invading kings from the northeast basically loot the cities. They just take everything they can find. They take their entire food supply before uh, continuing on their way back home. And in verse 12, we find they also just so happen to take Lot and his possessions. Lot, therefore, is basically kidnapped, maybe taken into slavery, maybe held for ransom, maybe as a hostage of some kind. Uh, we're not really told exactly what their thinking is here, but I think we would agree uh, that they have messed with the wrong family. They did not know what they were getting into here. So let's continue then with Genesis 14, verses 13 through 16. Genesis 14, verses 13 through 16. Then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew. Now he was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Ananer. And these were allies with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. Well, we have a survivor. We've got a refugee of some kind, don't we? Somebody who just barely made it out alive. Um, and this guy comes, he tells Abram what's happened. And it's interesting to me that this guy in the area, number one, recognizes that it's Lot who's been taken. But also he knows that Abraham and Lot are related. And perhaps also this guy knows that Abram has the power to do something about it. So there's a reason why he comes and explains this to Abram. And we also find in this passage that Abram has allies, doesn't he? So Abram has uh, made some connections in this area. He has friends that maybe they rely on each other for support. We should also note that in verse 13, we have the first use of the word Hebrew in the Bible. And if I remember this correctly, I believe this word ultimately goes back most likely to a word referring to uh, the region beyond in other words, it seems to be the way people described Abram as a wanderer. And so today we would say the immigrant, or maybe in those days the idea, uh, Abram is the guy from over there. Abram is the guy from the region beyond. Abram is a wanderer. And that's basically what this word Hebrew means. Uh, the word Jew, by the way, uh, would not be used for several hundred years. And it goes back to a description of those from the tribe of Judah, if I remember that correctly. And it's used for the first time, not until the book of Esther, which I kind of find interesting. So the word Hebrew, though, it is used early on uh, for the first time right here in the book of Genesis. And um, it seems to recognize the fact that Abram has wandered into this area from somewhere over yonder, we might say. Uh, from regions beyond. And I think in this sense, we would agree that uh, as God's people, we are still Hebrews in a sense, aren't we? Uh, all of us as God's people are simply passing through. We don't really belong here on this earth. Uh, this earth or this world is not our home. We're just a passing through as we sometimes sing. Uh, nevertheless, when Abram hears that Lot has been taken, notice he mobilizes his own private army. So 318 of his own men born in his house. So these are not slaves that he's acquired. These are people who have come into this area with him. They were born in this house. And Abram heads out in hot pursuit all the way up to Dan, which is way up north, kind of on the northern edge of what would later be known as Israel. And uh, I don't usually think of Abram as a warrior. Do you? You know, when I'm trying to picture Abram in my mind, I think of a guy kind of standing in a field, maybe with some sheep and, and that kind of thing. I don't think of him as, as a warrior, uh, as a military strategist. But I want us to notice in this passage, uh, Abram gets it done, doesn't he? And he, he does some things here. Notice in verse 15, he divides his forces. So there, there is a tactic here. So he's coming around from both sides, perhaps. And then notice also, secondly, that he attacks by night. And so he uses the darkness to his advantage. And I know I mentioned on Sunday how we visited the uh, Navy SEAL Museum and, and Memorial down near Fort Pierce, uh, Florida. 
a few weeks ago. Just an amazing experience. And in those displays and a lot of the things they had there, um, they emphasize that the seals are good in the dark, aren't they? And I think we understand that. Uh, that is an advantage that our military has over a lot of militaries in the world. We're able to operate in the darkness. And uh, certainly that is what Abram does here. So he divides up his forces. He comes around from both sides. He does this at night. And he defeats these foreign kings, not, not only defeating him, uh, not only defeating him, them there, uh, but he also chases them out of town. So he runs them out of the area. And notice here in this passage, when it's all over, he even brings back the loot as well. So uh, not just Lot, but he also brings the stuff, all of his possessions, along with the women and the people. So there were others that were kidnapped as well. Abram, therefore, is probably something of a hero in that area. Uh, this is one way to get a good reputation, isn't it? So if he was a wanderer before, certainly this would have helped him out in the eyes of the people. And uh, he does something that a, that a coalition of local kings were unable to do, even though he was almost certainly completely outnumbered. And of course, we understand it's because God was with him. And there was a blessing on Abram and the things that he was doing here. Well, let's continue by looking at Genesis 14, verses 17 through 20. Genesis 14, verses 17 through 20. Let's notice what happens next. Then after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shavah, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. As Abram comes back victorious, therefore, he is met by the king of Sodom as well as by this guy named Melchizedek, a priest of God Most High, a king or priest of Salem, king of Salem. And my understanding is that's the precursor to Jerusalem. And so he was uh, operating as a priest and a king in that area. Well, of course, a priest is the, uh, uh, the reference here to priest is the first reference to a priest anywhere in the Bible. And a priest is basically a go-between, somebody who stands between God and humanity. We don't know too much about Melchizedek. He just kind of pops on the scene. He just appears quickly and then disappears just as quickly. But he's mentioned later in the Bible. There's a reference in Psalm 110, verse 4. And then also in the book of Hebrews, I think eight times Melchizedek is referred to in Hebrews. And in Hebrews, the author is making the point that Jesus is qualified to serve as a priest even though he's not from the tribe of Levi. And to prove this, he refers back to Melchizedek, who was a priest of God even uh, many years before there ever was a tribe of Levi. The author of Hebrews describes Melchizedek as being without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Well, it's not that Melchizedek literally didn't have a mother or father, not that he was literally eternal, nothing like that. Uh, but I think the idea there is he was untraceable and there was no history. There was no genealogy. He wasn't a priest because his dad was a priest and because his dad before him was a priest, as it would have been in the New Testament times for those uh, Jews that uh, the writer of Hebrews was addressing. But he was making the point that God made him a priest, and God can make anybody a priest he wants to. And, um, and so the idea is, in the same way, Jesus is our high priest, even though he's not from the tribe of Levi. And the author makes the point in Hebrews that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. And so the Jews practically worshipped Abraham, but Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. And the one who receives a tithe is generally thought of as being greater than the one who gives the tithe. And the ultimate point he's making there in Hebrews is that Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek. Therefore, Jesus is greater than Abraham. And also, Melchizedek blesses Abram. And the one who gives a blessing is generally greater than the one who receives it. And I know that may seem complicated, 
And I do find it interesting, if, if that is too complicated for us to understand, we really need to go back and read the book of Hebrews because that author gets pretty frustrated that he wants to explain more about Melchizedek, uh, but his readers have come to need milk and not solid food. So this stuff we're, we're reading about Melchizedek, that's solid food. That's some uh, truly some, some deep water here when we start talking about Melchizedek. So I hope we're not discouraged by that, but I think it should cause us to go back and reread some things and try to learn a, a little bit more about Melchizedek and uh, why he was so important in the book of Hebrews. So if you want a challenge, just read uh, the book of Hebrews again, and that'd be a good review of Melchizedek and his importance in the whole scheme of things. Well, we should also note that Melchizedek brings out bread and also wine as a gift for Abram. This is the second reference, by the way, to both bread and wine in the Bible. Uh, the first reference to bread was back in Genesis chapter 3. I don't know if you remember that, but that's where God told Adam that he would eat bread by the sweat of his face. I'm just kind of paraphrasing there, but basically you can have bread, but it's going to be hard. It's going to be very difficult to make because there are going to be weeds and the ground's going to be hard and there'll be thorns and, and so on. And uh, the first reference to wine, if you remember, was back in Genesis chapter 9 where Noah got off the ark and he planted a vineyard, he grew grapes, and he got drunk on that wine after the flood. And of course he got naked and his kids got involved and it seems to have they've made fun of him a little bit and they got cursed and uh, at least one of them did. Anyway, go back and review that if you want to, but I'm just saying the same word is used, the wine that got Noah drunk and the wine that this priest of uh, God in uh, Salem is giving here as a gift to Abram. So uh, at least here it seems to be a positive reference. Bread and wine go together. This is a gift. Thank you for saving our people. Uh, that kind of thing. Well, in this statement from Melchizedek, notice he praises God and he recognizes that God owns everything. And he also recognizes that God has blessed Abram with this victory over his enemies. And I know that the reference to the giving of a tenth is a little bit unclear, at least in the New American Standard, as to who does the giving and who does the receiving. Uh, but that is definitely clarified for us in the next paragraph, as well as in Hebrews, uh, that it is Abram who gives a tenth to Melchizedek and not the other way around. Uh, as it's worded here, uh, he gave him a tenth of all. It's a little bit unclear who the he and the him would be referring to, but I'm just saying it clears it up later uh, that Abram is giving the tenth to Melchizedek. Well, let's conclude tonight with Genesis 14, verses 21 through 24. Genesis 14, verses 21 through 24. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours. For fear you would say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre. Let them take their share. Well, in verse 21, the king of Sodom has a proposal. <laughs> He wants the people and he wants Abram to take the stuff. Uh, but Abram very wisely does not want to be indebted to this evil, evil man. And I added the, the word evil there, uh, but I think it's pretty safe to assume based on what we know about Sodom, correct? I mean, from the last couple chapters, Sodom was an evil city. We learned about that in Genesis 13, 13. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners before or against the Lord. So I'm just assuming, maybe it's just me, see what you think about this, but I'm assuming that a city full of exceedingly wicked sinners is probably led by an equally wicked king. We tend to get the leaders we ask for. We tend to get the leaders we deserve. And that's true back then. It's also true of our situation in the United States today. We get what we vote for. Abram then declines the offer. So, no, I, <laughs> I'm not taking anything from you. He doesn't need the king of Sodom going around uh, claiming he's responsible for Abram's wealth. Uh, Abram will, however, accept reimbursement for what these rescued men um, have eaten along the way. So, sure, okay, you can pay me back, but you're not, you're not giving me all kinds of stuff. You know, you do owe me at least the food 
that I fed your people as I was extracting them from the jaws of these evil kings. You can pay me for that, but that's payment. Uh, that's not a gift. Uh, as to the others who helped, it seems Abram, he's fine. If, if they want to take, you know, let them get reimbursed. Let them take the spoils and allow them to take whatever is appropriate. But as from you, I'm not even taking a shoelace from you, basically, if we could put that in modern terms. And this is where we leave it tonight, with Abram basically a local hero, having rescued Lot and the others from these invading kings. Uh, as we try to summarize what we've learned tonight, I would just point out that we've seen at least a partial fulfillment of God's promise from Genesis 12:3. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. Haven't we seen that come true here already? King Cheddar was doing just fine, conquering the whole land, wasn't he? He was just blowing through it, capturing, kidnapping, left and right, all the way through, until he messed with Abram. Once he kidnapped Lot, that was the beginning of the end for that king. And then we've also learned tonight something about Abram. You know, think about the difference between Abram accepting those gifts from Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, not too long before this. And consider the difference between that and Abram refusing to take anything from the king of Sodom. I don't know about you, but it seems to me that Abram learned something in Egypt, didn't he? That, that was a maturing experience. Uh, Abram is maturing. I know on my resume, kind of keeping it up to date, there's a spot on there for maturing experiences and accomplishments. So as a gospel preacher, here are just some bullet points of some things that I've learned down through the years. And I think we would say the same thing for Abram. He is maturing. Some things have happened. And uh, certainly the event in Egypt allowed him to learn something that caused him perhaps to react in the way that he did now. I will not take anything from you. I don't want to be indebted to uh, the king of Sodom. And we'll see uh, Abram continue to mature over the next several chapters. So thank you for being with us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930 in the morning as we start a brand new study of the book of Isaiah. And I have not yet looked at that material, but I'm thinking it may be good to reread the first few chapters of Isaiah at some point between now and Sunday. Uh, Caleb has graciously agreed to continue on teaching the adult class on Sunday morning this quarter. So I am really looking forward to, to getting some review of the book of Isaiah and learning some new things from all of you along the way as we look at that book together. So uh, go ahead and read Isaiah or at least the first chapter or two, and that may give us a good, uh, good heads up as to what's coming this coming Lord's Day. And then we also plan on coming together at 1030 for our worship assembly as we continue with the fourth of the eight Beatitudes. Well, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of Abraham, and you are clearly a God who rescues the captives. You are also the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, as we have learned from your priest and servant, Melchizedek. Tonight we are thankful that Jesus is our High Priest. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer tonight. In Jesus we pray. Amen.